Hi, I'm Jason Freeman. I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, but this is not a Midwestern accent. <laughs> nope, this is what's called a speech impediment. At least I used to think so. I've been so lucky. I was born with cerebral palsy as a result of a birth injury to two loving parents who believed in me and gave me a very strong foundation. As a young kid, they told me I was the best, and who was I to disagree with them? <laughs> <laughs> Between kindergarten and first grade, I went to crippled children's hospital and school. Crippled Children's Hospital and School. Yes, that's really what it was called in 1982. <laughs> I went there full time for a year so I could get intense speech therapy and physical therapy to improve my verbal skills and find more coordination. In first grade, I spent half a day at Crippled Children's and half of it being mainstreamed into All Saints, a private school I loved. Then in second and third grade, I went all day to All Saints. After that, I switched to, to public school. In fourth grade, no, I'm in fourth grade, which is a good time because it means I didn't have to repeat third. <laughs> it's January. Snow's on the ground. The sky is gray. It's 20 below. Inside my grade school, I fidget in my desk. The heat is claustrophobic. I'm lost in thought instead of paying attention to social studies. I'm beginning to realize that I'm not like the other kids. In gym class, the other boys throw balls and catch them with ease. Often as not, these same ball balls fly away past me or I catch them with my forehead. <laughs> it's humiliating. I felt safe and loved at my school last year, but I feel horribly out of place here. I try not to think about the sound of my voice, but when I do, I know in my heart it sounds so different than, than everyone else's. I think it sounds gross. I think I am gross. Everything about me is gross. Why do I have to be different? It's so unfair. I repeat to myself, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I imagine the only way I have half a chance is to impress the teacher with what I have to say or shut up. I figure I have to be perfect at school because I suck at everything else. I have so many things I want to say. I have so many ideas, so many dreams, but I can't say them. I won't say them unless I know they are the perfect answer. Fifth grade, I only have one friend here. I can't think of what to say to the other kids. I'm a dork. I imagine the other kids hate me. I think I'm disgusting. I develop a crush on a girl in my class. <laughs> I also chew on my shirt because I'm awkward and nervous. The girl won't give me the time of day. Sixth grade, 
I go out for the basketball team. I catch lots of basketballs with my glasses. <laughs> I don't score a point all season. It's miserable. In 1989, seventh grade hits me hard. I'm afraid of accidental nuclear war breaking out between the United States and Soviet Union. I think I should be writing letters to Congress and the President to stop it from happening. But I'm so nervous and scared, I can't even seem to concentrate on that. Sometimes you just got to flip a page. <laughs> yeah. At school, no one is bullying me. They don't need to. I'm doing a good job of that on my own. I feel like nobody understands. I'm as lonely as the Maytag man on TV. <laughs> but at least he has a purpose and talks, right? I'm good for nothing. One day that spring, I leave school unannounced, riding my bike home furiously. I don't know it's the spring day. There might have been huge cotton, there might have been huge cotton candy clouds, mammoth oaks, just buzzing teeny buzz, a tiny buzz, teeny tiny tiny. <laughs> there, there could have been lilacs in bloom, but I'm blind. I'm so blind. <laughs> I, I thought that was me. I'm like, wow, I'm making lots of noise up here. <laughs> I'm in a panic. I read a suicide note without really knowing what it says. I think to myself, how can I do this? But won't everyone be better off when I'm gone? I sob and scream. I'm so confused. I eat half a bottle of aspirin fast and wait. Luckily, a voice inside of me finally communicates loud and clear and says, this is not the way. I pick up the phone and call, help, help. I can't do this by myself anymore. Help me, help me. Our fears can keep us silent. Not only do other people not get a chance to know us, but tragically we can lose track of, our, uh, of ourselves. But tragically, we can lose track of ourselves. That call for help was deeply vulnerable for me because I have been trying to survive by being perfect so people would perceive me as normal. And nothing about getting to a point where I ate half bio pills was perfect. My newfound willingness to communicate changed everything. What if I had decided to instead stay closed off? My life wouldn't have worked, period. My speech impediment and coordination differences were small potatoes compared to the fear and despair that led me to such desperate actions. My desperate and perfect call f for help sent me on a new path. After that day, after that day, I slowly began to open up, first to a therapist and my parents, then eventually 
eventually to friends and teachers. Recovery for me was made up of small things. I remember the night my dad and I were sitting at the dining room table and it suddenly occurred to me that, wow, I could transfer to a new school for eighth grade. Wow! But I told my, my dad my idea with hesitation because I felt like I was a kid and couldn't imagine I had the power to make such a decision. But luckily, my dad liked the idea and I changed schools. Writing longhand was agonizingly slow for me, so I asked my mom if I could dictate much of my homework to her. She said yes and took dictation for me hour after hour, night after night. That was an amazing thing for her to do. In high school, I wanted desperately to drive like the other kids, but I was so afraid that with my coordination, I would get in all kinds of accidents. Can about imagine? My, you can about imagine. My dad knew I had fears, so he accompanied me on my car rides as I learned to pilot a car safely. If I were to summarize those car rides in two words, the two I would choose would be close, cause. <laughs> yeah, close, many, many. But my dad stuck with me and we both lived to tell the tale. When I was coming out of my low, my mom listened as I talked about my fears for hours upon hours and would always remind me that this too shall pass. After college, I had a close female friend who would hold me as I cried and tried to sort my life out. She would say, I love you dearly, as a friend. <laughs> I, I went to my first yoga class. The teacher offered me modifications so I could do the class. Then, then she made a point. She made a point of personally inviting me back. This little bit of communication meant so much to me. The immensity, the immensity of communicating a truth can be overwhelming unless we take it step by step. And it's easier to do that step-by-step -step thing if you have like a mic on your shirt and you can actually <laughs> start. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but just, just uh, I mean, you've probably seen people stepping before, so, so we just recall that, that memory. <laughs> uh, um, the immensity of communicating our truth can be overwhelming unless we take it step by step. And that's still what I do every day. Life, right, is always delivering the new and different to the new and different to us. We have a choice. We can either respond to this difference in uncertainty by letting fear keep us from sharing ourselves. Or we can respond to it by speaking our truth and, and allowing that to propel us forward. As we face this choice every day, may we be brave and speak our truth. It can save our life. 
It can save our life and help others save theirs. Here's to all of us taking the journeys we need to take to find out the truth about all we are capable of being and achieving. They, they, uh, all of our stories are so important. Each of our stories are so important. Thank you for your attention and listening to mine.